Please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. You'll find the notes this morning's message in your bulletin, and if you don't have a Bible, you'll find the text in the back of the notes. We are working our way through a rich, dense passage. In fact, the the verses we're going to focus on this morning, uh, 7 through 10 of chapter 2, are some of the richest, clearest texts about justification, salvation by faith alone, from grace alone. But it comes as a conclusion to a 10-verse sentence, as best as we can figure in Paul's original writing. So I'd like to begin by reading all 10 verses of Word of Prayer. We'll dive in. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love With which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his kindness, grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord God, I pray that by your spirit you would give us power in our inner man, to comprehend what is the immeasurable power that is at work in and towards us, that we might have a better understanding of what you have done for us in Christ, what, what riches of grace are ours, what lavish mercy has been given to us, that we might see bigger, bolder, more amazing your grace towards us and that we might live in light of that knowledge and that seeing. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. This is now our third week, should be our final week, working through this first section of chapter two. If you remember, I'll give you a, a brief outline of where we're at in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In chapter 1, you have an opening greeting in the first two verses. And then chapter 1, 3 through 14 is an extended blessing, a benediction. And the, 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 the logic is God is to be blessed. Let us praise and speak well of him for all of the blessings he has given to us, for all that he has spoken well to us. And then he goes to lay out a Trinitarian understanding, both the Father The Son, the Holy Spirit, every member of the Trinity at work in eternity past, in the present, with a view towards eternity future, our salvation, which is rich and full, and I think so much greater than than we understand. And after this benediction, he goes on to a prayer, and he, he gives thanks on their behalf to God in God's hearing, and he wants to let them know, a healthy, maturing church, what it is that he is praying for them on their behalf. He writes in verse 17 in chapter 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know. So he wants them to understand something. He wants them to know something. And this is a knowing and an understanding that can only come through divine agency. It's it's a heart knowing. It's an inner man knowing. And what is it he wants us to know? Three things, three what's there in verse 18. What 
is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? And that third what, namely power, he wants us to understand more fully the power of God at work in us, towards us, that gets then an extended description. He tells us that power is in keeping with, is according to the same type of power that was at work when God raised Jesus from the dead, when God exalted him above all earthly powers, when God seated him at his right hand and placed all other would-be authorities and powers under his feet. That same power is the power at work in us. Well, how much so? Well, so much so that we learned last week that the answer to our dilemma in chapter 2, remember we see our former condition and our present condition, first individually, and then our former condition, and our present condition, corporately. We've been working our way through that first. Prior condition, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2, is our problem. We were dead, we were enslaved, and we were under judgment. And he, he tells us amazingly, we saw this last week, that God is an act of pure, benevolent grace. His good pleasure, his loving heart, it pleased him to make us alive together with Christ, to raise us together with Christ, and to seat us together with Christ. These are the very things he pointed to at the end of chapter 1 to show God's power. And what we learn is in Christ's resurrection we are raised, in Christ's exaltation we are exalted, in Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father, we too are seated. That is the degree of of beyond similarity of co-action, that God in doing the one is also doing the other. That's the measure of the power. We saw that last week, that God sovereignly has made us alive. And Paul stresses that this is of grace. It's not in response to anything we do. That point made abundantly clear as he speaks of us as dead. We were not sick. We were not dying. We were not feeble and weak. We were dead. He made us alive. And he did that not in response to anything we did. We talked about how sometimes we think if a person will believe, God will make them alive. No, we are made alive to faith. We are made alive enabled to believe. In fact, let me read a quote from Charles Spurgeon on this point. A man is not saved against his will, he says, but he is made willing by the operation of the Holy Ghost. A mighty grace which he does not wish to resist enters the man, disarms him, makes a new creature of him, and he is saved. So, so make no mistake, we are forgiven when we believe. You, you must believe. God has called all men to repentance and faith. God has called on all people to believe. And, and not until you turn and trust in Christ, not until you turn and place your faith in him will you be forgiven But the spiritual life necessary to do that, the the change of heart that is presupposed in that change of will and belief, that is God's initiative in us. We were dead, he made us alive. So we sang this morning, and, and for Paul, that is crucial to make it clear this is all and entirely of grace. Otherwise, you may conclude God is very gracious to those people who invite it, God is very gracious to those people who ask for it. And then mixed in with grace is some level of desert, some level of merit, some level of boasting. And we'll see this morning that Paul wants to make it very clear that what God has done excludes boasting. You and I cannot say, yes, I've received lavish grace, but it's because I asked for it. No, 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 no. You were dead. I was dead. God made me alive. God made you alive if you are in Christ. So last week we looked at the three great solutions God had to our three great problems. We were dead, verse 5 of chapter 2. He made us alive. We were under the power and sway of the world and the devil in our flesh. We were enslaved and he freed us. He has raised us with him, raised us above the authority of those things. And we were children of wrath. By nature, not simply by deed, but the very heart of who we were was a rebel. And rather than being children of wrath, he has 
made us co-reigning with Christ. He has seated us with him. We've gone from wrath to rule. And so those three great verbs in 5 and 6 solve our problem. But now we're going to move on to a further discussion. Paul has already interjected once. And you see that in in chapter 5. I mean, in verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Then he interjects, by grace you've been saved. Then he goes back to the second and third thing God did for us. Well, he's getting ready to do an extended discussion of grace. He's really made a great point. He's arranged this long sentence to highlight the nature of grace. How more undeserving could we be than dead? Actually deserving wrath. Actively working against God. Carrying out the desires of the body and mind under the sway of the devil, following the course of the world. He he highlights that up front to make it clear that whatever happens is grace. So first we're going to look at, number one, the purpose of God's grace and salvation. The purpose of God's grace and salvation. God has a reason for what he does. And we see that in verse 7 with the word, so that... Now we're getting the purpose, intentionality. Why is it that God has done this? Well, to some degree, we've already been given some purpose because of the great love with which he loved us. Verse 4. But God's purposes go beyond that. Why has God made us alive together with Christ? Why has God raised us with him? Why has he seated us with him? Well, on the, on, it is true because of the rich mercy from the great love which he has for us, but... So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God's purpose. We're going to look at this quickly in two points. We get the when and the what. God's purposes in our salvation look forward to eternity future. The when throughout all eternity. You're saved here and now, and it's a salvation we learned that was planned in eternity past, but its full conclusion, its crescendo, has not even yet been reached. As as great as the grace in which we stand, as great as the salvation which we've experienced, there's a sense in which Paul is saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what's so stagnant. That's part of what Paul wants us to understand, how great this is. If If you're bored with God's grace, you don't get it. So that in the coming ages, he might show something. So let's just pause for a moment. And Paul has already spoken of a coming age, right? At the end of chapter 1, look at verse 20. And he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So here, Paul's contrasting Christ's exaltation over every power and would-be authority now and in the age to come. Singular, age. was a subtle shift here. You notice in verse 7, the coming ages. And I don't think that's accidental. In fact, one commentator, um, O'Brien, writes, the plural ages is not simply a stylistic variation of the singular, but a more general conception implying one age supervening upon another like successive waves of the sea, as far into the future as thought can reach. In light of this meaning, it may be claimed, and then O'Brien quotes F.F. Bruce, that throughout time and eternity in the church, this society of pardoned rebels is designed by God to be the masterpiece of his goodness. Paul's saying God's intention, his ultimate goal in your and my salvation has all future eternity in view. Age after, however many ages there may be, however many more things God has planned, his purpose in our salvation looks to that. that that's, that's staggering. As far forward as you can imagine, as many billions upon billions upon trillions of years, and epochs upon epochs, God is going to still be showing something in our salvation of his rich grace. When? Throughout all eternity. What? What's God's purpose? That he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And now we get part of the reason why he has age upon age in view. If God's 
Grace is immeasurable. It will then take all of eternity and age after age to put it fully on display. God intends to display something. So get, so get that. We've seen grace now. We, we sing about the grace now. We sing about forgiveness now. We sing about being made alive now, empowered to walk in the light now. And, and Paul's saying that's not really the centerpiece of what God wants to put on display. He's got more to highlight and show, and it's going to take all of eternity future to do that. In one sense, the salvation that you and I have experienced is just getting us fit, just getting us ready so that we can experience the fullness of his grace. He intends to bring us to him in eternity. And so, of course, we cannot be brought to him sinfully. Of course, we cannot be brought to him as children of wrath. So we're cleansed and we're washed and we're forgiven and we're adopted. But all of that is just the preparation for the final goal of the gospel, which is us united in Christ with God, face to face, beholding his glory as he lavishes grace upon us. It's no wonder that Paul prays that we have spiritual power to see and understand this. It staggers the mind. And notice again that this immeasurable grace and kindness towards us is all found in Christ. We we saw that again and again ten times in Christ or in him is in verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1. Every blessing God has, every good thing God has for you is to be found in one place and one place only in Christ. This rich, immeasurable mercy and grace that is to be found only in Christ and is inexhaustible and will take eternity to display. So that's, that's God's ultimate pr- purpose. He wants to put on display his, his glory of his grace and then we therefore become trophies of grace. We become trophies of grace. God's great purpose in our salvation is that he might for all of eternity display the immeasurable riches and his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. So we turn in verse 7 now to verse 8. 9 and 10. Um, One of the greatest summaries of the reality of of our salvation by grace. And so we move from God's purpose of grace and salvation to his pattern of grace in salvation. Paul now does with more extended um, words what he interjected in in verse 5. Remember, in verse 5, he's going through, he's done three things for us, and after the first, he just can't resist. He By grace you've been saved. Now he's going to pick that up and unpack it even further. And that really is his great purpose in our understanding, is the grace at work. Yes, we need to understand what God has done for us. But Paul wants us to understand it's grace, not merit. It's gift, not payment. The pattern of God's grace and salvation. He does it by a declaration and by means of a clarification. Positively and negatively. This is a common New Testament way of of explaining truth. It's common for us as well. I'm saying this, not this. We're saved by grace, not works. So let's read verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your undoing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. So what's the declaration? The declaration is that you and I, if we are in Christ, if we've come to believe, and by the way, this all presupposes what he said earlier. Because remember, already we've heard back in chapter 1 that we heard the word of truth, we believed in him, we've come to hope in him, we've been made alive in him, we read back in verse 4 and 5 and 6, we've been raised with him, we've been seated with him. If that's true of you, if you've heard the gospel you've hoped in Christ, if you've believed, what's also true of you is you've been made alive. You've been raised. You've been seated. And so Paul can say that you and I are in a state of salvation. That's my attempt to bring out the nuance of a Greek verb tense, the perfect verb tense, where the emphasis is a current state of being, a current effect from a past action. We have been saved, but the focus is we currently are saved. We are, be, we are in the state of being saved. You and I are in a state of salvation. That's what he's saying. For you have been saved by grace through faith. So then, after making this astonishing declaration, understand, again, so often when we say salvation, we simply mean forgiveness. 
And absolutely, salvation is not less than forgiveness. But part of what I hope you're beginning to see in these past few weeks is it is so much more than just forgiveness. Because what is Paul summarizing by salvation is absolutely back in chapter 1, verse um, 7, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Absolutely, that's salvation. It's to be forgiven. It also means, according to Um, Verse 4 of chapter 1, he chose us in him. And verse 5, he predestined us for adoption. So salvation means you've been forgiven. It also means you've been chosen. It also means you've been adopted. It also means, at the end of chapter 1, his great prayer, that you have an inheritance. It also means, according to chapter 2, you've been made alive with Christ. It also means you have been raised with Christ. And it also means you've been seated with Christ That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means for the eternal and infinite God to save you and me. These things are all true of us. And so often we can can minimize what what God has done in salvation simply to forgiveness, which is wonderful. But we can forget about the other realities. And part of what Paul wants to do is remind us of these things. That our eyes would be open to these things. We would praise God for these things. And in light of these realities, live differently. So I'd encourage you to, to, to view God's salvation as richer and bigger and fuller than you may hitherto have imagined. So you are in a state of salvation. Then he gives two clauses to um, Clarify or give greater meaning. By grace, through faith. And so what I want you to think of is, is this. By is referencing the ground or the source. To use a weak analogy, if you've got a, a light stand, a lamp stand with a light that's lit, the power that is illuminating that light bulb is from the, the socket, from the power plant, from the nearly inexhaustible power that's produced. Even though you're just using tapping into a small amount of it, it's by, from, of, maybe that'd be the best way to think of it, of the power from the socket, by means of the cord. The cord is what is connecting the lamp to the socket. I think that's a rough analogy of what Paul is saying here. We are saved, we are in a state of salvation that is of grace through the conduit of our faith. Like the cord connecting the light bulb to the wall. Our faith unites us to Christ. We are in Christ by faith. And so Paul wants to make that point abundantly clear. That the source of our salvation is grace. And the vehicle, the means of union and receiving the benefits of that salvation are through faith. And this is an important important point to make. This is the heart of understanding what is taking place in the gospel. And in one sense, the gospel is looking at the reality of Christ's death. You and I are sinners. We are children of wrath. And, and Christ lives a sinless life. And Christ dies on the cross in our stead as our substitute on our behalf. He receives God's wrath for our sins so that we can receive forgiveness in him. But from another vantage point, all that I just said is an act of grace on God's part. And it is all received by faith on our part. Even as I've argued last week, that very faith itself is God's gift. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace meaning God's free and unmerited mercy and kindness. We've talked about this at length previously, but I'll just remind you that essential to the nature of grace, we'll see it even in this passage, is it cannot be obligated. It cannot be owed. To speak of obligated grace is to speak of square circles. Married bachelors. Military intelligence. No, sorry. Um, I apologize. It's to speak of something that is nonsensical. In other words, if we ever catch our... This is important because our knee-jerk reaction we hear about all God has done for us is to say, well, why didn't God do that for somebody? And be careful. We're beginning to suggest God ought to have. It would have been good for God to have. It would have been better for God to have been gracious too. And that sounds an awful lot like obligated grace. It sounds an awful lot like a square circle. 
And I'd encourage you to go back and read the encounter with Moses on the mountaintop where God says, Hi, I'm God, and I mercy whom I mercy. That's my glory. And we, we, can, we can become so accustomed to grace that we presume upon it. If some friend of yours, your child, your mother, your father, some dear friend of yours gave you a precious and valuable Christmas present, they brought it to you and they gave it to you, if your response was, well, why didn't you get one for my neighbor down the street too? Imagine the insult and the offense that would be communicated. Paul wants our jaws to drop at God's grace. If your initial response to this declaration of God's grace is, well, why didn't he do that for? You don't get it. And you're still thinking in terms of law and debt and obligation, not free gifts and grace, which Paul is going out of his way to make clear. So grace, free and unmerited mercy and kindness through faith. Here's how we receive. Here's how we're united to the benefits of that grace. The benefits of all this salvation are only to those who believe, are only to those who have trusted in Christ. By grace through faith. Trust and confidence in, and you can put one of two things in the blank here, Christ or the gospel or what Paul said in chapter 1, he called the word of truth, verse 13. And ultimately, what we are trusting in is who Christ is and what he has done. That's the object of our faith. Is is Jesus Christ crucified on our behalf. We are saved of or from grace through faith, trust and confidence in Christ. there's, There's the glorious reality. But it needs clarifying. And Paul clarifies it. And this should be instructive for us because he, he presumes and understands that we are likely to mistake this. The medieval church mistook this. Rome, to this day, mistakes this. And so now he gives the negative clarifications. He says, we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So, this Salvation is your blank. Some people have argued that this references faith. I do not believe it does. I believe it references the salvation, which certainly includes faith. This salvation, all of it, is not from us, not from our activity. It is the gift of God. And then again, I would, I'd stack that up. Everything that Paul has included in salvation. This choosing is not from us. It is the gift of God. This adoption is not from us. It is the gift of God. This being raised from the dead spiritually is not from us. It is the gift of God. This being raised with Christ is not from us. It is the gift of God. This being seated with Christ is not from us. It is the gift of God. This salvation is not from us. It is the gift of God. Well, what more do you mean by not from us, Paul? Not from works, not a result of works, not from out of or in any way responding to works so that no one may boast. So here's your blank. We are not saved from works. Our salvation by no means comes out of our works. There is a sense in which Christ's works are the basis of our salvation. But in reference to us, we are not saved in any means with any respect to our works. And that then excludes boasting. So we get this immeasurable, lavish grace. We get grace upon grace upon grace. But Paul also wants to make it clear, God gets absolutely 100% of the glory, full stop, no compromise, no sharing. He's jealous for his glory. There is no boasting. You can't even make little boasts like this. Well, I made a decision and he didn't. I asked Jesus and he didn't into my heart. All of it, the entire package of salvation is God's gift and you and I get no boasting. We saw this last week. We were made alive to believe. Even our faith is the gift of God. We believe. No one believes for us. No one makes you believe. No one twists your arm behind your back. God makes us willing and eager to believe in changing our heart and in, in speaking life into us. The salvation is not from us. It is the gift of God. We are not saved from works that no one may boast. 
And in that respect, as regards to the Protestant Reformation and understanding that the great, the great eclipse of the gospel in the Middle Ages was um, the rise of sacramentalism and, and, and Roman Catholicism, and, and many cults teach, many other religions teach some version of, sure there's grace and sure there's faith, but there's stuff you do. Whether it's rituals and rites that you perform or receive, baptism, communion, prayers for the dead, whatever. Or whether it's a certain amount of good works you do to be saved, go on a pilgrimage or pray towards Mecca or whatever. In stark contrast to all such thinking, Paul insists it's not of you, it's not of works, it is a gift, no one gets to boast. And in this passage, probably alongside of Romans chapter 3, are probably the two clearest passages on that point. And if you have any confusion here today about what you must do to be saved, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. There's nothing you need to do. You can be saved, adopted, forgiven, without leaving your seat. What then becomes of our boasting, Paul writes in Romans 3? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works, no, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified. That's Paul's term he develops in Romans for declared innocent, forgiven, legally justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now there's this, there and here are as simple as you're going to hear it, as clear as you're going to hear it. That's crucial to get, Okay. So the pattern of our salvation, what, what does it mean by pattern? I mean, what's, what's the nature of this grace? How does it work? How does it apply itself? How is it received? What, what doesn't it mean? So that's one great and crucial clarification. We are saved by grace through faith, not of your activity, not of your works. It's a gift. There is no boasting. But Paul needs to make another clarification. And I trust that most of us here today heartily amen point number two. Hallelujah, amen, not by works, not by deeds of the law, not by doing things. The danger for Protestants like us is we can so love that truth that we downplay the next thing he's about to say. So I want you to notice that in one breath, in one sentence, Paul's going to say both these points. And what we contend to do is because historically in the church there's been a confusion over the place of good works in justification... And it was taught and believed that you had to do good works to be saved. We've frequently decided, you know, it'd probably just be better if we just don't talk about good works at all. Or if we do, sort of make that kind of like an advanced class. Right? We don't want to bring any confusion. We certainly don't want to return to Rome. We don't want to return to sacramentalism. So, you know what? Let's just not talk about good works. Or certainly not for a good while. After someone gets converted. Paul does it here in the same breath. And it's not accidental. Not a result of works. Verse 10. For his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For good works. That's intentional folks. That's intentional. So let's look at point three. The time we have left. The product of God's grace. Since you knew it was going to be a P didn't you? The product of God's grace in salvation. And that's important to get product. This is the consequence. This is not the cause. This isn't what made you alive. This isn't what made you forgiven. This is what God has wrought and created in you in your salvation. And Paul's emphatic on that point. But he also is not timid to say this just after saying salvation by grace, through faith, not of works. You can then say in the very next breath, this, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The product of God's grace and salvation. We're just going to look at the what and the why. Paul says, and this is another astounding statement, we are his workmanship, his craftsmanship. We are his masterpiece is what one of the translators, I think it was um, John Stott, F.F. Bruce said, a masterpiece of his goodness. This language of creation um, 
is the same language used a little later in Ephesians. We are the Father's workmanship, his craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Go to chapter 3, where the same verb is used. Okay? Chapter 3, verse 9. To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. So this is the same verb Paul used, the same language Paul used to speak of God's creation in Genesis is the same now metaphor he's using for his recreation in Christ. Just as God created all things in the beginning, so God has recreated you and I if we're in Christ. This is also true of us if we are saved. This is also part of what it means to be saved. What? We are his workmanship. By the way, there's another parallel here with verse 3. The ESV doesn't make this parallel clear, but it's from the same word family. One's the verb, one's the noun. We, verse 3, lived in the passions of our flesh, working. The ESV is carrying out. Working, crafting the desires of the body and the mind. So what were we busy making, crafting, working? Our own desires, according to the flesh, the world, the devil, and our minds. What does God work and craft? Trophies of grace. Trophies of grace. There's there's a contrast. We were busy at work crafting things. They brought nothing but wrath. God has crafted you and I. And again, we're acted upon. Notice the passive verb. We're not boasting. I didn't make myself. I didn't remake myself. Just like I didn't birth myself. Just like I didn't born again myself. Just like I didn't make my soul to live. So I had nothing to do with being made, crafted, and created, recreated in Christ Jesus. We were created. We are the Father's craftsmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. This is another mercy, another grace, another good thing that is ours only in Christ. So that's that's the product. What does it mean to be saved? It means you've been chosen. What does it mean to be saved? It means you've been adopted. What does it mean to be saved? It means you've been forgiven. What does it mean to be saved? It means you've been made alive together with Christ. What does it mean to be saved? It means you've been raised with Christ. You've been seated with Christ. What does it mean to be raised? It means that you've been recreated by the master craftsman of the universe in Christ. That's what it means to be saved. And that's why we need eyes of faith to grasp and understand the magnitude of God's grace and goodness towards us. But not only this further what, but we also get a why. Why has God recreated us? And here is the part we can get nervous at. You got to just face. Paul just said one of the two strongest, I'll, I'll grant, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is probably one of the two strongest, clearest, simplest passages about justification by faith alone apart from works of the law. That in Romans 3, 27 and 28. But we cannot shrink back or get uncomfortable with the other thing he says. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works. So in your why, here's the blank. We are not saved from but for good works. That's what Paul says. We are not saved from. Our salvation had no means comes out of our good works. It's no means the result of our good works. It no means is originated in our good works. But make no mistake, we've been saved to, for, good works. It's the Father's intention. And in that, you can see even the further redemption he's done. He's removed the penalty of sin, but he's also removed sin's power. And one of the ways he shows the glory of his grace, one of the ways he shows his goodness, is not just removing the debt that sin has brought, but by breaking the cycle of slavery that we saw in verses 1 to 3. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, no more. In which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power. No more. Carrying out by nature. Carrying out the desires of the body and mind. And now, in Christ, that can be no more. 
He has recreated us. He has fashioned us anew in Christ, and that recreation is for fitting us for, making us ready for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved from, but for good works. And this is not a topic the Apostle Paul is shy on. And again, our temptation is in in emphasizing justification by grace through faith, apart from works, hallelujah, amen, we can get really timid then about saying anything with an emphasis on good works. And to the degree that we don't want to be confused or to confuse others, great, amen. But we do need to find ways, like Paul here has found a way, to articulate. If, if you're a Christian, if you claim to be saved, you're also making the claim, God has remade me for good works. Understand that. When you, when you speak of someone else and their salvation, does your child know the Lord? Yes, my child asked Jesus into their heart when they are seven or eight or 10 or 12 or whatever. You're also saying, yes, God has remade them in Christ for good works. You can't say one and not say the other. That's the claim we are making when we speak of our salvation. We've been forgiven. We've been adopted. We've been chosen. We've been raised. We've been made alive. We've been remade in Christ for good works. And we can be in danger of so wanting to uphold justification by grace through faith alone, apart from works of the law, and by so narrowing the gospel to only ever speak of its benefit as forgiveness, that this aspect of recreation and good works and a new form of life drops out of the equation, or at the very least, drops in its prominence to 10th, 12th, 20th on the list. But understand Paul, right here in this sentence, is setting up the entire second half of the book. Everything he's going to say in the second half of the book rests upon what he's saying right here. His entire application, his entire exhortation rests upon what he's saying right here. He thinks it's a big deal. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Which God prepared beforehand. Just as from the foundation of the world he adopted us and chose us for adoption and sonship, which we read back in verse 5, right? Chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to himself. He also, not only was he choosing us and planning to adopt us, he was planning good works for us to walk in. And that too was in his mind beforehand. And what is his intention for these good works? It is that we should walk in them. Which again is the remedy to the problem in the first three verses. Because remember, we were dead men walking. Usually dead people don't walk, but we were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, verse 1, in which you once walked. We had a former manner of walking. And the the picture of walking before the automobile is your your daily conduct. The Australians might say the walkabout, the way you walk about and conduct yourself throughout the day. And we had a, a way formerly of walking about, and it was the way of death and the way of the world and the way of the devil and the way of our own desires. And the salvation that God has given for you and for me doesn't just remove the penalty of that. It does. Praise God. We are no longer children of wrath. We are no longer condemned. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But God also intends to remedy that futile, shameful way of living. And just as we formerly walked a certain way, now God has remade us, recreated us in Christ This, by the way, also still follows the pattern of the original creation. You remember God made the heavens and the earth. And what did he do? He fashioned a context for the man and woman work for them to do, right? He made them a garden and he brought them to the garden. So God created and then he prepared works for the man and the woman to do in the garden. Well, Paul's using the similar language and imagery. He's recreated us in Christ and has prepared work for us to do, good deeds for us to do. And that notion of walking, if you turn with me to chapter 4, becomes the motif, his figure of speech for all of the conduct that he calls on us to do in the second half of the book. Remember, the first three chapters are primarily telling us what is indicatives. And starting in chapter 4, we get into commands, 
and imperatives. And how does Paul organize all of the different ways we need to live in light of what he has said? Well, through the picture of walking. So Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy. And understand, he can't call on us to do that without explaining God's remade you to enable you to walk. Yes, 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 you were dead. You were a slave. He's freed you. He's given you life. He's raised you. He, in fact, has remade you specifically to walk a certain way. Well, what way? Walk this way in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called. Go down to chapter 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Don't walk like Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. There he says it negatively. Don't walk that way anymore. All that possible because we've been raised, we've been made alive, we've been seated, we've been recreated. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Ephesians 5, verse 8, well, 7 and 8. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. And then finally, in 5.15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So Paul's going to group all of his instruction to the church, all the way we need to live, under the, the rubric of different types and manners of walking. And all of that is explained as possible and set up back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Which means Paul declares and explains this before he ever calls on us to act upon it. So maybe part of the reason you and I may struggle with carrying out the instructions in the second half of Ephesians is because we haven't yet really grasped, really meditated on, seen this reality. Because Paul doesn't call them to do stuff until after he calls on, he tells them why it is they're even able to do stuff. So that, that's, that's where we're going to end this morning. It's in this glorious reality. Your salvation is bigger than you think. Your salvation is greater than you think. You've been chosen. You've been predestined. You've been adopted. You've been forgiven. You've been brought near. You've been raised from the dead. You've been raised above and out of this world. You've been seated with Christ. You've been recreated for good works. And in light of all that and the great power that is at work, On our behalf, we are then able, believing that, knowing that, to start trying to carry out the instructions Paul gives. If you want to know how to apply this morning's message, just read Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 and see all that Paul has to say unpacking what this new walk is. He introduces the idea here. God has got good works for you and for me to walk in. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, we'll start spelling out with clarity and specificity what those good works are. I'm going to call the worship team up now. We're going to close in a word of prayer, and then we will close the song. There's no way we cannot praise God, praise our wonderful, merciful Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, I just uh, marvel at the grace that you have given us. Marvel at how undeserved it is. Marvel at the fact that we have not even see, seen the pinnacle of your grace yet, but await for eternity to see it. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us clarity, both on the reality that our salvation is from nothing we do. No good deed, no work, no effort on our part, but that we have been saved unto good works, and that if we claim Christ, if we claim salvation, we are also claiming We have been remade, radically changed, that you have made us for good works. I pray that you would give us the grace to walk in them. In Jesus' name, amen.